When it comes to life, and specifically individual cells that a lot of life, like us, are made out of, one of the more mysterious and more difficult questions to answer is in regards to the complexity inside the cell and how various structures formed over time. Because over billions of years of evolution, animal cells and plant cells, and specifically eukaryotic cells, developed a lot of complexity that relies on a concept known as endosymbiosis. A kind of a symbiotic relationship between various types of organisms providing for each other and getting something back in return. And the best example here is what you see in this video, mitochondria. Billions of years ago, mitochondria were most likely individual bacteria. Bacteria that were exceptional at producing energy. Mostly in the form of a molecule known as ATP. And then at some point something happened and they essentially formed a symbiotic relationship with various cells out there, providing that extra energy to them and in return getting a lot of safety and essentially a house to live in. But obviously possibly something else. And so over billions of years, Modern cells evolved to use mitochondria as an essential organelle in pretty much every cell inside our body. There are over 80 trillions of them inside of each of us, and basically almost every cell contains them. And something very similar happened to plant cells, and specifically various algae and chloroplasts. Another bacterium that was very good at photosynthesis that became absorbed by various algae, with some eventually evolving into plants. And so over billions of years, both mitochondria and chloroplasts became so specialized that they can't actually live outside of a typical cell. They require our cells for survival, and our cells even provide them with a lot of additional proteins in order to reproduce and in order to copy themselves over many, many generations. And so this process of ingestion of bacteria, where the whole cell and the ingested bacteria eventually become codependent, seems to have happened at least three times. The absorption of chloroplasts potentially was the first time, with this beautiful picture of a typical moss showing us huge amounts of chloroplasts present in each of the cells inside this moss. Then we had the absorption of mitochondria, which became essential for a lot of more complex life on the planet, basically responsible for producing a lot of energy, but also for regulating a lot of things in our bodies, basically making these organelles pretty much crucial for more complex life. But then, a lot more recently, the researchers also discovered the most recent such case from an organism known as Polynella. And this is something that probably happened only 60 to maybe 100 million years ago, basically during the time of the dinosaurs, as opposed to billions of years ago, which is when we believe mitochondria and chloroplasts became part of various cells. And so approximately 60 million years ago, another cyanobacterium merged with amoeba, forming a new organelle known as chromatophore or essentially a completely separate photosynthetic organelle that seems to only exist in these specific organisms. With all of this happening relatively recently in terms of geological scales. But basically this idea of various specialized bacteria getting swallowed and merging with various more complex cells and eventually becoming a part of them seems to be a relatively common scenario in evolution of complex life. And this idea today is known as the endosymbiotic theory. Basically, the process of ingesting bacteria in order to form this prominent relationship that then changes the cell and creates a new organism. And though mitochondria and chloroplasts still obviously have their own DNA, they're completely dependent on the cell they reside in. But so far, these examples only present us with two separate chemical reactions that life relies on. We have photosynthesis and we have the production of ATP or the energy molecule. We know that bacteria evolved to actually use a lot of other chemical reactions for the survival on the planet. For example, something that plants rely on as well is of course the idea of nitrogen fixation. Plants need nitrogen for growth and normally most plants get nitrogen by creating a kind of a collaboration or once again symbiosis with nitrogen fixating bacteria somewhere around the roots. This is sometimes referred to as the root microbiome, and it's I guess kind of similar to what we have in our guts, that essentially helps roots digest various types of matter and acquire different nutrients they need for growth. But here, just like with our guts, the microbes don't live inside the cells, they basically live around the roots, forming their own communities. And this type of bacterial symbiosis is extremely common. As I mentioned, we have something similar inside our guts, and pretty much most animals out there use bacteria for something to some extent. But when it comes to nitrogen, 
it is a very crucial element. And it's actually kind of surprising that no life so far has developed an ability to basically integrate these bacteria into the cells forming organelles. Kind of like mitochondria, kind of like chloroplasts. Or so we thought. Transition into the actual topic that we're discussing today. Turns out, something has done that. The researchers just now discovered a new organism that seems to have nitrogen fixating properties. And the organelle in this case is now going to be referred to as nitroplast. Kind of like chloroplast, but in this case, it fixates nitrogen. With all of this discovered in a single-celled algae known as Brarudosfera bigelowi. And the cyanobacterium that seems to be present here, responsible for the fixation of nitrogen, is now referred to as UCYN-A. And the thing about the organism where this organelle is located is that it's already kind of strange. It's essentially what's known as a coccolithophore. We've actually discussed this in one of the previous videos you can find in the description, but in essence these are some of the strangest looking organisms on the entire planet. They're all marine organisms, they essentially rely on oceans, they're also extremely successful and exist everywhere, and more importantly, they seem to form these unusual shield-like formations around the cell. And it's not clear why. They're actually super diverse and do come in a lot of varieties and have definitely existed on the planet for over 100 million years. As a matter of fact, that previous video that I mentioned in the description talks about the ones that existed around the time dinosaurs perished. But despite their complexity and their overall numbers, we still barely know anything about them because they are super tiny and are also generally very different from a lot of other life. But the organism we're discussing today looks like this. It contains unusual five-fold symmetry and contains 12 unusual pentagons forming a kind of a dodecahedral structure, but only 10 micrometers in size. And these organisms are also autotrophic. They basically feed themselves. And so by covering themselves with this calcium shell, they kind of protect themselves from possible hazards outside. This unusual shell is known as the cocosphere. Although the real reason why the cocosphere exists is still unknown. It's actually one of the mysteries here. Nevertheless, these organisms are super important because they capture a lot of calcium, but also a lot of carbon. This is actually made out of calcium carbonate. And as a result, they form one of the biggest parts of the carbon cycle in the oceans. Which is why so many scientists try to understand them a little bit better. And so this time, by using X-ray tomography and by watching these cells divide using individual frames, the researchers realize that as they divide, one of the unusual bacteria known as Acelocyanobacterium thalassa that lives inside of them seems to rely on a lot of genetic code and a lot of proteins from the host cell. For example, they don't seem to have genes producing Rubisco, which is usually essential. And they're also unable to fix carbon via photosynthesis. Yet, the cell they live in can do all of this, but just doesn't really have any nitrogen. And so approximately 2,000 various proteins essential for this bacterium seem to come from the host cell and not from the DNA inside. In other words, this is basically an actual organelle and not a bacterium anymore. And obviously, in return, it seems to fix nitrogen, allowing the host cell to then use it for food. And so basically, this is the first ever known nitroplast. And so instead of relying on some kind of a culture of bacteria, like roots of plants, just like with mitochondria, this just became an organelle. Although obviously it's not clear when all of this happened. But what's I guess more impressive is that this is not just like one or two examples here. We're actually talking about an extremely widespread organism, pretty much found all over the planet, which basically means that this is a very successful evolutionary change that provides the host with some essential advantages. The fourth known organelle that used to be a bacteria. We have mitochondria, chloroplasts, chromatophores, and now nitroplasts. But I guess more importantly, the scientists are now thinking of how we can maybe use this for actual plants. In other words, is there any way for us to replace this and possibly genetically modify plants somehow in order to give them not just chloroplasts, but also nitroplasts, which would then make them way more efficient at basically growing, but most importantly, would suddenly make nitrogen fertilizers kind of useless. And since fertilizers are both expensive and generally are not very good for the environment, being able to somehow introduce nitroplasts into plants might actually change everything. There's obviously no real way we can do this yet, but this unusual discovery could definitely present us with some options in the future. 
But because this is a super recent discovery, there's really not much else we know about this, and I'm sure there will be more discoveries in the next few months. And so until then, or until we know something else, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.